All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So we have three pieces of news today. Number one, we're going to look at the uh, new monoclonal antibody that has been given emergency use authorization today. I think some of uh, the material there would make you happy and some of this would actually make you wonder that why did this happen. And then we'll talk about the FDA uh, and the Pfizer's intervention request for the Freedom of Information Act based uh, document release and how the judge has responded to that. We'll also see a document sample as well that has been released by Pfizer. And then finally, we'll also talk about the um, Pfizer's rolling submissions extension. So let's start our discussion. So first, here are the references. This is the FDA's update. It is hot of the press, Feb 11. This is Lilly's statement. This is their study that they used. The, the monoclonal antibody's name is Bebtelovimab. Bebtelovimab. They have fun names. Uh, this is a clinical trial. This is also about the same Bebtelovimab. Then I also wanted to remind us that there is Sotrovimab as well. Both of them are in smaller quantities, 600,000 each so far, but still these are solutions. So Sotrovimab and Bebtelovimab. Then these are the core documents. We'll go over them, some of this document and discussions there, and then the rolling submission and the related data. So let's start. And this is, of course, drbean.com. So I'm going to go over my presentation. So no disclosures. This is the painting for your viewing pleasure. The name is, the title is Balance. So we are in Omicron era still. This is a medical disclaimer. We do not, this is not a medical advice. What you're doing is educational. And here is the uh, monoclonal antibody. It's a good news. However, you would see that that good news actually may not be entirely that good. And that is a, the thing that made me surprised. So here, Lily's monoclonal antibody receives emergency use authorization because it is effective against Omicron. So this is my comment, really. And I would explain to you. So let me just give you a foreshadowing that number one, that uh, effectivity is actually seen in vitro. It's not an in vivo test. It's in vitro, number one. And uh, all those amazing scientists who used to say that there is a thing called ivermectin and that has Australian in vitro study. And why should we have in vitro? Study? Here is an in vitro efficacy. Secondly, you would see that the approval is for at-risk patients and you would see that FDA's own statement about the efficacy for at-risk patient is that it is generally better. That means they do not have significantly different data. So the statement is it is generally better. This is the same statement as you may have heard for other drugs as trending positively which such studies are smashed and throw, thrown away. And people make comments like, this study is not even worth the paper on which it is printed. And here you would read that in a few minutes. At the same time, I'm really grateful that we have one more monoclonal antibody that can address Omicron. It will save lives. The point is, why don't we offer these kind of leniencies or flexibilities or scientific rigors, whatever this rigor is, to the other as well. So that makes me mad. But anyways, so the authorized dosage of baptelevimab is 175 milligram given as an intravenous injection over at least 30 seconds. Just for the reminder, so trovimab is also an option. So you have to keep these two in your mind. If you have someone who may be at risk, Maybe they are older. Maybe they have comorbidities. You should text them. And that is Bebtelovimab and Sotrovimab. If they can get it, if they can keep that in their mind, that is important. So here is the FDA. FDA says monoclonal antibody for the treatment of COVID-19 that retains activity against the Omicron variant. That is the important thing. 
because there are other monoclonals that are not efficient or effective against the uh, Omicron and so they're not, they are actually, their authorization has been withdrawn. You saw a few weeks ago, uh, tech, uh, Florida's governor. Now the EUA, check this out, the EUA of Bepthelovimab is for the treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19 in adults and pediatric patients 12 years of age and older weighing at least 40 kilogram which is about 88 pound with a po positive COVID-19 test and who are and here are the keywords at high risk for progression to severe COVID-19 good so at high risk of progression so they're not hospitalized they are out of the hospital they are they've become positive but there is a possibility because of their comorbidities or other risk factors that they might become serious it is approved for them authorized actually for them good now let me before i show you the the dosage and the uh, side effects let me actually show you one more thing from from the FDA site. So I took this from here. Now I'm going to go down and read this part. So here the FDA is saying what kinds of tests were done. Of course, the primary reason to bring this monoclonal antibody to the table is in vitro efficacy against a possible SARS CoV 2 Omicron like variant spikes. So good. That's a good thing. Check this out. <clears throat> in another part of the trial involving mostly high risk individuals, so now we're talking about the high risk for whom this is authorized. That is, the patients with risk factors for progression to severe COVID 19 illness. 150 patients were randomized to receive a single infusion of beptelovimab alone or a single infusion of beptelovimab with other monoclonal antibodies. An additional 176 high-risk patients received beptelovimab with other monoclonal antibodies in an open-label treatment arm. So that's the setup. Check out the results. The rates of COVID-19 related hospitalization and death through day 29, seen in these who in those who received beptelovimab alone or with other monoclonal antibodies were generally lower. So look at the phrase here, were generally lower than the placebo rate reported, reported in prior trials of other monoclonal antibodies in high-risk patients. Placebo rates of other trials of monoclonal antibodies generally generally lower it it just makes me feel uh, uh, i am smiling because it is making me upset so this is my way of controlling myself the monoclonal antibodies were generally lower so there is if really they had data that would show was showing good significant result, meaning with the correct p-values and with correct uh, confidence intervals, they would have put that over here. They would have said significantly reduced risk of hospitalization or risk of mortality. They don't have it. This is the state phraseology for trend generally lower than the placebo rate reported in prior trials of other monoclonal antibodies in high-risk patients. Honestly, with Omicron, generally, the other antibodies, high-risk patient data is not applicable anyways, because Omicron severity and the hospitalization and death rates have changed. Then they say conclusions are limited. As these data are from different trials that were conducted when different viral variants were circulating, and baseline risk factors varied. So they're saying it, they're putting it in front of you, in your face. So you cannot really complain that, hey, you didn't tell us. They're telling you. But look at this. I'm going to go up for a second now here. This is their 
result for non at risk patients the placebo controlled portion of the trial enrolled 380 low risk patients patients in this part of the trial were randomized to receive a single infusion of beptalovimab alone or beptalovimab with other monoclonal antibodies or placebo treatment with beptalovimab resulted in a reduction in time to sustained symptom resolution compared to placebo. So reduced time. This is very Remdesivir-like statements. Reduction in viral load relative to placebo was also seen on day 5. Good. Not bad. But this is not approved for this cohort. Not authorized for this cohort. This is a low-risk cohort. Authorization is not for this. Authorization is for this, in which it is generally better. So with that in mind, I mean, that's what it is. It just tells me that FDA can simply say, I'm going to do something and I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it right in front of you. And you can expect the next statement they would have in their mind. Okay, so I'm going to continue here. Beptalumimab is not authorized for patients who are hospitalized. So it is authorized for those who are not in hospital. This is very similar to BAM lenivimab. So not hospitalized, but at high risk. So it is not authorized for patients who are hospitalized, who require oxygen. And then they say that we have observed that if you give monoclonal antibodies to patients who are hospitalized and are on oxygen, the this could actually cause negative outcomes. So it is stopped from doing it. It is not authorized. So that means somebody who is hospitalized and is in oxygen, you cannot request to give them monoclonal antibodies. They will not. That means, uh, other than my rant, there is still a takeaway, and that takeaway is Bebtelovimab and Sotrovimab. V Sotrovimab. These are the two that should stay in our mind. We should write it down somewhere. We should give it to others and say, please, if there is anyone at risk, if you become positive, ask for this. So now this is Lily. So if I go to Lily for a second, this is Lily. And so Lily is saying, Non-hospitalized patients with mild to moderate COVID-19 at high risk of progression to severe disease for whom alternative COVID-19 treatment options approved or authorized by FDA are not accessible or clinically appropriate, Babtelovimab neutralizes accessible or, or um, appropriate. And then they say Babtelovimab neutralizes Omicron as demonstrated by pseudovirus and authentic virus data. Pseudovirus and authentic virus testing demonstrate that Bebtelovimab retains full neutralizing activity against Omicron, currently the predominant variant in the US. So I'll go to that, that how does it work? But I want to complete this over here. An important part for pregnancy and breastfeeding, they do not have sufficient data. So they're saying there are insufficient data to evaluate a drug-associated risk of major birth defects, miscarriage, or adverse maternal or fetal outcomes. Beptelovimab should only be used during pregnancy if the potential benefit outweighs a potential risk. And then they say breastfeeding, there are no available data on the presence of beptelovimab in human or animal milk. Then... Beptelovimab, I showed you this, low-risk patient, it showed reduced viral load. High-risk patient, I read this before, I've already ranted about it. High-risk patient is for whom it is authorized. However, for high-risk patient, the, the phraseology, the narrative, actually is not very technically encouraging narrative. So they say the rates of COVID-19 related hospitalization and death through day 29 seen in those who received beptelovimab alone or with other monoclonal antibodies were generally lower. Conclusions are limited. 
Now, side effects. Possible side effects of beptelevimab, itching, rash, infusion-related reactions, nausea and vomiting. Then they say it is possible that we have seen hypersensitivity reactions, anaphylaxis, infusion-related reactions in other monoclonals. So this may do that as well. And then in the lower paragraph, in addition, clinical worsening following administration of other SARS-CoV-2 monoclonal antibody treatment has been reported and therefore is possible with beptelevimab. It is not known if these events were related to SARS-CoV-2 or other disease progression. So that is one. Now I want to talk about how does it work? Why is it retaining is its strength against Omicron? And I pray, as much as I'm upset with FDA's uh, seemingly apparently manipulative data or phrases, I will be glad if it is in other solution for us, if it protects us. So if we look at now the mechanism for how does it protect us, they say, Okay, so I think I was reading that in their PDF. Okay, so the basic idea is this, that there are certain mutations on the spike protein, especially the receptor binding domain, which have made other monoclonal antibodies not very effective. And they found out that beptelovimab is, so this is a, a incidental found uh, antibody. They had a bunch of antibodies. They ran them through on this uh, pseudovirus that had a spike protein from Omicron. And they saw that this antibody reacted with it. So they isolated this antibody and they saw that this antibody's epitope or the binding site was resistant or it was binding to a part on the receptor binding domain that, were, that was conserved across many SARS-CoV-2s. So imagine if my hand is the receptor binding domain. I could actually draw that as well. So imagine my hand is the receptor binding domain and there is various kind of SARS-CoV-2 and one SARS-CoV-2 variant, let's say Delta has this mutation and the other one has this mutation and someone has this mutation and these two areas are not changed the um this one what is the name of this uh beptelovimab beptelovimab is able to bind here or its binding unit or binding area is for here so the other mutations do not matter because of that it has efficacy and that is actually a good news I'm not against the beptelovimab. I really am happy about it. I just think it is not properly conveyed what it is really worth. But that is how it is working. So they have given examples in their documentation of some mutations that have rendered other monoclonal antibodies ineffective and shown that this antibody with those variations can still work. And it binds to RBD and it interferes with the binding to ACE2. That is the basic um, work that it does. And I have, I thought I have that open somewhere. So give me one second. I'm actually going to show it to you. Okay. So now I have it open. So I think I was reading this and I have that in my mind. So in this document that is accompanying it, they have shown this is the ACE2 receptor. And then if you go a little above, see this tells you that I did my homework. I just close this document. Here. 
So this is where this blue thing here is a spike protein receptor binding domain. The yellow is the ACE2, and the red is the Lily's BEV telovimab. And so that is how it is interfering. And similarly, over here, you can see various mutations. And you're seeing that it does not care for those mutations because it is binding to a different part. So it still interferes with the binding, but it is not effective, affected by majority of these mutations. Here they have given uh, bemtelevimab. Is this the correct? Um, I just keep forgetting its name. Bebtelovimab. I was calling it Bem. So this is Bebtelovimab here. This is Regeneron. So they had given it with others as well. So green is Regeneron. And then the uh, receptor binding domain and spike. And so this works there as well. So they found out that with other monoclonals or without, it had a similar efficacy. That means the efficacy was really coming from this monoclonal antibody. So that is the, the way it works. All right, so I'm going to now switch gears to the next part of the discussion, which was really interesting as well, and that is this. Pfizer's intervention. So we all heard about it, that uh, Freedom of Information Act for using that a uh, organization and organization re requested for the documents from FDA. FDA said we'll give you 500 documents per month and it would take us 75 years to give you all the documents. And judge had said, no, you are going to start giving those documents now and it would still take, I don't know, five years. Then came Pfizer in the mix and Pfizer put a request saying, and let me show you those requests now. So first of all, let's look at the, the this is the website for public health and medical professionals for transparency documents. This is their website, the link is in the description. Over here, if you go to the site, they would have various document links the court documents and Pfizer documents. So here, there are some documents that I have opened. So this is the order summary. It is actually very interesting. Before the court, so this is Pfizer coming in and look at the Pfizer's uh, uh, request. Pfizer is saying before the court is Movant Pfizer Inc.'s motion to intervene for limited purpose. And what is their purpose? They are saying that there is commercial pieces of information and there, is, there are uh, organizational secrets which will be leaked if these documents are released. So they are saying on January 28, the court held a hearing on the motion where Pfizer represented that their interest in the litigation are currently aligned with plaintiff and defendant, FDA. To that end, Pfizer seeks, like plaintiff and defendant, the expeditious production of the requested documents. So they said, we want to help you produce documents faster, but we have an interest in this whole process. Pfizer also correctly recognizes that the parties currently aligned interests could potentially diverge. For instance, the parties could disagree about the, which documents or portion of the document should be or should not be redacted prior to production. So anyways, here is the fun part. The judge said, Mark T. Pittman, he said, the court, however, concludes that it will defer ruling on the motion until a conflict is imminent or has in fact manifested. So they called it, he called it and he said, sure, you're saying that you have some commercial interest or your, your business secrets in the documents that will be released. So why don't you do this, that when that is about to happen, 
or has happened, then talk to me and I'll give you a ruling then. So the court will therefore hold Pfizer's motion in abeyance, uh, in suspension. Pfizer's, Pfizer is instructed to file a concise notice with the court if a conflict is imminent or has in fact manifested. So ordered on this 7th of Feb. So Pfizer actually came to help FDA, just like FDA goes and so they're working hand in hand apparently. And judge said no. And they did not reject their request. He simply said, you know what, I think he called it. He said, fine, I understand what you're saying, but where is the proof? And if it is happening, then talk with me. And then uh, on this site, there is actually examples of the Pfizer's, uh, sorry, FDA's data release. So here is one such example, and I'm going to quickly show you. This is hundreds of pages, or I think more, more than a thousand. So if I go in here, this is 3,452 pages. So I cannot go through all of them, but generally, here is the kind of data that is being released now. So there is header text, there is visit. So this is a person. Subject initials are not there. Of course, this is redacted. But there is a person who has a response as part of the vaccination process. And it says here the person is, you'll see their, their date of birth is not given by, I think the year is present here. Subject ID is this, birth date is this, sex is this, ethnicity is this, race, and then they continue on and they provide data so this is the kind of data for example criteria or description male or female participant and so on what is interesting in this order was one more thing that i thought was interesting it doesn't show here but there was one more interesting thing that cracked me up and that was that in one of the court orders to pfizer was that sorry to fda was that FDA will not count 20 lines as a page. They will count 40 lines as a page. So that was also interesting. So anyways, this is the kind of data. And now the final part of the discussion, and that is, remember a few days ago, we were up in arms to say that why are they doing this rolling submission when they are saying Pfizer is coming out and saying, Pfizer-BioNTech, that our vaccine for toddlers six years to five years is not showing great results. And so they were not applying, they were not submitting. And then the news became that FDA said to them that we are requesting you to submit. And this 15th, they have the committee as well. Although today, the latest is, Pfizer and BioNTech provide update on rolling submission for emergency use authorization of their COVID-19 vaccine in children. And what is the update? Today announced plans to extend their rolling submission to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, seeking to amend the emergency use authorization of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine to include children under 6 through 4, which had been re requested by FDA. Remember, FDA said, we are asking you. So what is the change? They are saying that third do dose data will be available by early April. So they are going to be then requesting to extend it till that time. Then this is interesting for me, this blue part, if I can zoom in a little more on this one. The Independent Data Monitoring Committee for the study supports the continuation of the trial according to the protocol and believes that the data collected to date indicates the vaccine is well tolerated check this out well tolerated and support a potential third dose regime or regimen do you know what they're saying so it's the independent data monitoring um, agency which is looking at data they have a right to look at data they just won't tell it to others and you could talk with them and and they or if they see something bad going on in the trial they can say all right you know what stop stop it's causing harm 
So here, Pfizer is referencing the independent monitoring team and they are saying, look at this phrase, they're saying it is well tolerated. So we're not talking about efficacy anymore that it would save children or it is saving more children. It is well tolerated. And then supports a potential three dose regimen. That means the two dose was actually not working. So they're not saying that, hey, the two dose is working. They're saying, we think that three dose will work. So keep going. So that is interesting. So FDA says three dose will work. Pfizer says, Biotech Pfizer says three dose will work. Independent monitoring committee says three dose will work. So then here is the extension. The extension allows the FDA time to receive updated data on the two and three dose regimen, conduct a thorough evalu evaluation of it and facilitate a robust public discussion. I think they figured out that this would cause a lot of heat for what they were doing. And so that is the discussion all about FDAs and Pfizer. M. Gregory says three times a charm. Um, Michelle says, good news, Girl Scout cookies are for sale. <laughs> So Ben says third dose protects against Omicron, it's just Delta. So I think Delta is really not out there anymore. So it is Omicron. And Delta two doses were working. Absolutely. Margaret says, good call, Judge Pittman. Yeah, I think uh, that was very wise to say, okay, I understand what you're saying. You have a concern. Come back to me when you have that concern imminently uh, happening or about to happen. So with this, uh, thank you very much. Please like, subscribe, and share. And if you would like to support this work, there are links in the description. You can buy me a coffee or use PayPal or become a patron. I will come back in a few minutes and I would discuss some more items. Thank you. Bye.